baby up. Listen, I'm from the United States, most of you know, and everyone up in the United States is obnoxious and overbearing and loud. Well, I am going to be that times 10 this afternoon. I've just had five Red Bulls backstage, and I'm ready to go. So first of all, let me thank a couple of the sponsors, the Ingenia Group that's sponsoring me along with Twix, which we're going to bring them out a little bit later. And I also want to thank Turner for putting out the, the, the Wi-Fi here. Isn't that awesome to be able to have that? Give them a round of applause. Oh, brothers and sisters, that sucks. Come on, when I ask you for a round of applause, better yet, how about we turn this into a religious experience this afternoon? How about we turn this in like I'm the preacher and this is the congregation and we'll have some fun. So give me an amen for digital marketing. Amen. That sucks. When I ask you for an amen, you sound like a bunch of Germans or something here. Germans live in constant fear that someplace, sometime, somewhere, someone's having a good time. When I ask you for an amen, I want to hear one of those big, loud, Baptist, American amens. Give me an amen. amen. Much brother. Well, I love the introduction. It reminds me of the first time I met my wife's grandmother. When I, when I met Grandma Agnes, my wife is five foot one, and she weighs about 105 pounds. And Grandma Agnes is smaller than her, and I'm six foot three, uh, 280 some pounds. And, and Grandma Agnes, she looked up at Tammy, and she looked way up at me, and she looked at Tammy, and she looked way up at me, and she turned back to Tammy and said, Isn't he bigger than necessary? So I feel like that this, this afternoon, being your last speaker before we have the cocktail party and the coffee and everything else that we're going to have. And I want to talk to you about change and driving change and how important change is to us in this digital world. And some of you might say, well, geez, Jeff, your last job was three years ago at the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. And in the last few months, I've been doing interview after interview after interview, talking about Kodak's bankruptcy. And they would talk to me and say, well, what happened? I said, well, it happened back in 1975. Here was a company that was at more market cap than most of the world companies at the time. Had 150,000 employees. They were making a product which had 90% profit margin. And in 1975, a gentleman by the name of Steve Sasson invented the digital camera. He sat in a lab in Rochester on a cold winter night in 1975, and he took the component parts of various digital items, and he constructed what became the very first digital camera. And he took a photograph of a photograph. And the next day, you can imagine what it was like for him as he ran from executive to executive to show them this unbelievable thing that he invented, the way that it was going to change the way that we looked at digital images, the way that we looked at all images. And everybody told him to put it away. And that's what happens. That's what happens when companies live the hubris of their success, fail to realize the business that they're in. In fact, at that time, see, Kodak, you would think that, the, you would think that they would realize that they were in the emotional technology business. They had the only product that people would actually run back into a burning building to save. I know that to be true because back in 2001, I was struck by lightning. It's a true story. In my home, lightning came through my home, struck me. I'm laying on the ground. I can't see. I can't hear. My house is on fire. As I wake up, my wife is running with a box of photographs as she runs by me going, are you okay? <laughs> see, Kodak built emotional technology. 
They weren't in the film business. But yet if you walked up to any employee today or yesterday or three years ago or five years ago, that's what they would tell you. And we had people who fought us. In fact, at the beginning of my book, Running the Gauntlet, I dedicated and put this dedication at the front of the book to all the naysayers, opportunists, obstructionists who stand in the way of driving change and driving progress in any organization. Note, we will beat you. See, that's what you folks are. That's what IAB is all about, is to drive change because of the digital changes, the interactiveness of what we do and how we do it, driving that change. See, for us, it's about adapt, change, or die. Because if you don't adapt and you don't change, I'll guarantee your company will die. And I can show you example after an example of companies that do that. See, our job is to drive change. And I'm not talking about change for change's sake. We don't jump in a car and lock the steering wheel in. We adapt, we move, we, we move the pedal. In fact, it's supposed to be different. Most of us think success is a one-way street. That's the way it's supposed to be. It's a very messy job. And it's only for the very strongest leaders, not only in the company, but certainly in the world and everywhere else. See, I'm asking you to become agents of change, people who want to change the way that we do things, people who see that change is what we do every single day at every moment, that our business isn't about driving digital marketing, it's about driving change. But we improve every single day with every single thing that we do, and I'm looking for change agents, or what I call clock changers. When I went to Kodak about six or seven years ago, I was so excited to go to work for that company, I went a week early. I jumped on an airplane before I was supposed to be there, before I passed the urine test or any of the things that they make you do. Oh, people, that's funny. I don't care where you're from, right? <laughs> I jumped on an airplane, and I was sitting next to this 25 or 26-year-old girl or young woman, and I said to her, because I wanted to engage her in conversation. I wanted her to ask me what I did because I wanted to tell her I was so proud. I mean, I'm a big executive. I mean, a C-level executive in a Fortune 100 company. I mean, it's, it's easier to be a professional athlete in major league sports in the United States than to be an executive at the C-level in a Fortune 100 company. So I was so excited. I wanted to brag. And so I was waiting for her to ask me, and she started talking about herself. And she started yada, 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 and went on and on and on and on like I wanted to hear any of that shit. <laughs> Finally, she took a breath, and she turned to me and says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm the chief marketing officer for Eastman Kodak. And she said, who's that? I knew my job was going to be pretty tough. So when I got to Kodak, I called a meeting of my entire team, and I said I wanted to see what kind of team I had. So what I decided to do was get to the meeting a little early. And, and if you've ever been in one of those big companies or industrial companies in a big complex where you've got lots of buildings, on the wall was one of these kinds of clocks. And so I got there like 15 or 20 minutes early, and I got up on a chair, and I moved the clock, and I changed it, and moved it ahead about 15 or 20 minutes. Because when people came in, I wanted to see what they would do. And so they came in, and they started looking at the clock. And then they'd look at their watch, and they'd look at the clock, and they said, the clock's wrong. It's not right. The clock's wrong. And they would start talking to the other people and say, is that right? That's not right. I'm not, I'm not late. I'm, I'm early. I came early to impress the boss. And it's a, we, we, should, we should do something about this clock. We should call someone. There must be someone in the company that's in charge of clocks, and we must find them. And this would go on for like 15 or 20 minutes. These freaking people sitting around talking about this goddamn clock. And they would go on and on. Finally, I said, stop it. Let's move. We got a good agenda. We got to see. And for two, three weeks, this went on. I'd have meeting after meeting in this room, and the clock would be off. And every time, they'd come in and say, the clock's off. And finally, I said to somebody, why doesn't somebody just do something about it? And this woman got up, and she went over to the clock. She pulled her chair up. She hiked her dress up. 
Much like the dress that the woman stole from Rob earlier. Trust me, I saw Rob in it. He doesn't look that good. She's much better when she's not wearing it. Anyway, oh, I had to do it. I had to go there. Uh, you're my kind of crowd already. I like this. Anyway, she got over to the chair and she hiked her dress up. She stood on it and she changed the clock. I made her my chief of staff on the spot because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for clock changers. We're looking for clock you know, change agents in the process. We're looking for what I call white buffaloes. These are very rare creatures. It's only the strongest and most brave because see all the wolves and everybody else comes out to try to kill them. I want people who change the process. People who are problem solvers, not seekers. I have people bringing me problems in the C-suite every day. I want people who say, I've got something that fixes that. I want clock changers. That's what we're looking for. And I found out through all this process there are five things that drive people to fail in driving change. Number one is fear. Fear. We're, we're afraid. And I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you that anything that's new or different, it's only two or three seconds of fear. That's all you have to worry about. Look, all my life I wanted to be a cowboy. I, I did. I, I, I wanted to have horses. And before I could afford to do it or do it, I, I decided I was going to do it. Finally in my life I said, now look, I've always wanted to be a cowboy. I'm going to buy some horses. And I'm going to learn to ride. And I had no clue how to do it. So I went out and bought the book Horses for Dummies. And I got the tapes. And, and I went to friends, and I went on websites, and I looked at all the stuff, and I, and I bought a saddle, and I bought the reins, and I bought a truck and a trailer to haul the horses. Then I bought a horse. And then I got the horse in the trailer, and I took him, and I decided I'd, I better put the horse at a stables so I could have him there before I turned him loose on my ranch, because if he loosed on my ranch, I couldn't find him, I couldn't catch him. So, and I took him out of the trailer, and I tied him to the fence, and then I decided I'm going to ride the horse. This is awesome. This is my first time. Now, have you ever seen a saddle and a reins and all the straps? I had no clue how to put, the, put it on or what to do. And even though I'd watched the videos and I'd seen everything, I still didn't have the practical experience of doing it. And I was scared. So I knew I needed to ask somebody. And I looked over and there was this like 14-year-old girl. I had to walk up to her. I was so scared. Big, strapping cowboy to be. And I had to walk over to her and say, will you help me saddle my horse? See, if you want to be a maestro, you got to learn to play a lot of bad notes. I had to learn to swallow my pride. It only took a few seconds. Now I can rope horses, ride them, shoe them. I catch them. It's awesome. Fear. Overcome your fear. The second reason is tension. Causing tension. Healthy debate is good. At Kodak, that was my job, the chief tension officer. In sports, we have a saying, no pain, no gain. Why don't we have tension in what we do to cause something? See, our job as leaders is to take everybody from the center of the stage and take them to the very edge. That's what we're supposed to do. Oh, but no, you have people in the company, like HR and legal, those crazy little bastards, right? And their job, they think, is to drag you back to the center where it's safe. Well, that's not their job. See, their job is to keep you from falling off. And that's what we have to do. We have to be better customers with them. We have to be able to tell them, no, 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 I'm going to stand on the edge, and I'm going to stand on one foot. We are there to cause tension in everything that we do. That's our job, is to cause the tension and to make things different than the way they were. Third, to be radically transparent, to be open and free in terms of talking about things. People know what's going on. How many times have you sat in a room in some big meeting and you've seen the elephant sitting there on top of the table? It's wearing a pink tutu. It's dancing. And we all know what its name is. But yet we fail to talk about it. So driving radical transparency, that's what I like about social media because it's, it's scaring that out and making it happen. Number four is risk in terms of driving risk in the company. 
This is a good one. When I was at Kodak, we launched an inkjet printer, a desktop printer, and we launched it against one of the biggest competitors in the market. See, I call them Big Ink. Big Ink, I can't tell you what their name is. They made $9 billion last year alone off of inkjet cartridges. In profit, $9 billion off of ink. Our model was that we said, because their model, their model was you basically take a printer off the shelf for free, but we're going to charge you for the ink with exorbitant prices, and the ink's locked up behind counters. Basically, it's like, here's the crack pipe, and we charge you for the crack. That is funny, too, people. Come on. That is funny. Now, we decided that our model would be a fair price for the printer and half price for the ink. Now, let me tell you about this ink. Every night we watch the news, I don't care where you're at, whether it's Mexico, India, China, wherever, they put the price of oil on the news by barrel. You know what's more expensive than oil? Buy ounce, more expensive than oil? Bottled water. Bottled water's more expensive than oil. You know what's more expensive than bottled water? We're going to have it later on. Vodka. Okay? But if you had a really good year, more expensive than that? Champagne. Yes, my friend, champagne. And then if you've had too much vodka and champagne, you know what's more expensive by ounce than that? Penicillin. Penicillin, actually because you might need penicillin after having too much vodka and champagne. And more expensive than vodka, oil, bottled water, champagne, and penicillin times 10. Ink! Do you know what it would cost you in America to fill up your tank with ink from Big Ink? Do you have a clue? I mean, if, if right now in the United States, it's $4 a gallon, and you have a 20-gallon tank, and Americans are paying $80 to fill up their tank, they're going wacko crazy. They're so mad. Do you know what it would cost you to fill up your tank with ink from Big Ink? Anyone want to guess? How much? 5000 not even close. $462,000 is what it would cost you to fill up your tank with ink from Big Ink. Now at Kodak, we were only going to charge you half that, okay? So we're in this fight against Big Ink. I'll tell you their initials, HP, okay? And I decided that it was to really needed to push them, to really poke them in the eye so that they would get mad and they would talk about the ink. Because if I could get them to talk about the ink, I could get them to focus on the difference in, in prices and the way in which the model was. So I decided to hire Vinny Pastore, who played Big Pussy on The Sopranos in the show The Sopranos. Because who better to show the decadence of the model than a gangster? And so we decided, I said, look, let's do a mobile campaign. Now, folks, this was like six Seven years ago, before anybody was doing mobile, I said, let's go do a mobile campaign. And let's put a, an, it is really raining outside, isn't it? I'm glad we're inside. You could be outside getting wet. And instead, you're in here getting entertained. Amen. Right? Amen. Well, this side needs to clap a lot more. I'm going to start talking to this side a little bit more. So I decided that we we're going to do a mobile campaign and we would run an, um, um, uh, an ad in the motion picture theaters before the main feature and they would see the ad and they would see a thing and they would text us and they would get a coupon for 50% off of ink. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? So I said nationwide. So we hired Vinny Pastore. This is what the spot looked like. Vinny drove up. The gangster drove up in a black Lincoln Continental next to the docks. He gets out. He's wearing a black leather coat, just like he is on the slide there. He's carrying a baseball bat. He walks to the trunk. He opens up the trunk. He looks in the trunk at what you think is a body, and the camera is showing a shot looking at him, and you see his face in the screen, and he goes, you've been lying to us. You've been cheating us. You've been robbing us blind. The family says, you've got to go. And then we show a picture of an HP inkjet printer in the trunk. 
He takes the printer out, he sets it on the ground, he beats it with a baseball bat, he ties a chain on it, ties it to a cement block, and he throws it into the river. He gets back in the Lincoln Continental, and he puts his arm around a Kodak printer. And he says, welcome to the family. And then the screen said, don't get whacked by high inkjet prices, text, so, text the number, and get 50% off. We tested this. Double digit response. Double digit. As a marketer, you know what that means. I mean, I'm basically peeing my pants from excitement of what this is going to mean. So I tell the team, let's go nationwide. Let's go, baby. Let this baby go. So over the weekend, I'm running from motion picture to motion picture theater watching. People are laughing. I'm watching. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is going to be unbelievable. I can't wait to see my office on Monday and see the number of texts that we got. So I go in on Monday morning. I sit down at my desk. Two people come in. They got a sheet of paper with the number of texts that we got over the weekend. They put it on my desk. They slide it across my desk. I pick it up. I look at it. And on the sheet was written the number two. Two. I said, what, two million? And they go, no, Jeff, two. I go, I, I got to tell you, you don't have to be a smart marketer to know that this is not a good rate of return. I said, this is a problem. I said, I made a major expenditure on this. I told the board about it, everything. This is not good. You get everybody that's involved with this campaign, and you put them in the office and get them in, and we're going to talk about this. So they came in. I said, somebody explain to me what just happened. I said, we tested this. Doubled, double digit response. We tested this. I said, even the people at IAB Mexico would find this funny. So somebody please explain to me what the hell went wrong? What went wrong with this campaign that we only got two texts nationwide? That's all we got, two texts. Finally, someone raised their hand in the back of the room. I said, what? And they said, Jeff, what do you do with your phone when you walk into a motion picture theater? What do you do? Turn it off. I said, where the hell were you when we came up with this idea? Right? So it gets back to our point about being radically transparent. I turned to everybody and said, hey, no one died. No one died. We repurposed it. See, you have to be willing to take risk in the business. That's what you guys are out. That's what leaders do. That's what we do. That's how we drive. That's what we want. The fifth area is promises. Driving promises. I'm not talking about forecasts. I'm talking about freaking promises. I'm talking about real promises, things that really happen, things that mean. I'm talking about mutual conditions of satisfaction. This is where someone's a customer and someone's a performer. Let me give you an example. How many of you ever go to McDonald's? Come on. All right, some of you aren't making eye contact with me, so I know that you go too. So you go to McDonald's, you pull up to the drive-in like I do, and you shout out your order. You pull up to the next window, and you pay your money. You pull up to the next window expecting to get your food. But then they come to you and say, no, sir, it's not quite ready. If you would just pull up over here to this little parking spot over here, we'll bring it out to you. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. You know why? Because clowns lie. <laughs> clowns lie! That's why. Because we're talking about mutual conditions of satisfaction. In fact, what you have to do is do what I do. So when they come to you and they open the little window and said, Sir, I'm sorry, your order's not quite ready. If you just pull over this little parking spot over here, we'll bring it out to you. Go, no. No, thank you. I'll wait. And I roll my window back up. Pretty soon, the 14-year-old assistant manager comes over and knocks on your window. <laughs> said, Sir, you're holding people up. I go, I don't mind. And I roll my window back up. Pretty soon the 16-year-old manager comes over, <laughs> knocks on your window and says, sir, is there a problem? I said, yes, there's a problem. See, we had mutual conditions of satisfaction, young man. I gave you my order, you took it. I gave you my money, you took it. I'm here at the window to take my food and you're not giving it to me. In fact, you've asked me to pull over here to parking purgatory and yet you're not offering me anything in exchange. Maybe you'd like to give me one of those McMinty shakes or one of those apple pies. You want to give me one of those, I'll pull over. If you're not, I'm staying right here and I roll my window back up. 
Now when I go to McDonald's, I give up my order. I pull up to the first window, I pay my money. I pull up to the second window, my food is thrown through the window into my car. Driving mutual conditions of satisfaction. That's what it's about. It's about what is the promise. Mutual conditions of satisfaction it has three different parts. The customer, the performer, and the action cycle works like this. In phase one, we have the offer. Phase two, we have the agreement of that offer in terms of how it's supposed to be agreed upon. Then we have the actual work that's being done. And in phase four is the delivery and acceptance. Have any of you ever made a pinky promise with your children and never had to break it? That's what promises should be in business. That's what promises should be between you and the marketing teams or you and the sales team or you and your client or customer. You make a promise, you don't break those promises. As we ask ourselves why you're in this game, think about why you're doing what you want. What's your 118? Look, I used to have you guys come sell to me. You used to come to me. I had over 3,500 vendors at that Fortune 100 company, and you would come to me and try to sell to me. And you'd bring your products and services. You'd show up with a PowerPoint presentation, 40 slides long. And at the end of an hour, I still didn't know what the hell you did. Right? That's because you don't have a 118. What's your elevator? I call it the elevator pitch 2.0, the digital version, the 118. See, this is it. 118 seconds. That's what you should be able to sell. Tell me what you do. Eight seconds is the average attention span of an adult. I know that to be true. I looked it up on the internet. 110 seconds is the average elevator ride in New York City. From the time that you press the button, wait for the doors to open, step on, ride up or ride down and get off. That's how much time you have. So you have eight seconds to hook me, to get the information, to get me to get the lean-in factor of what I want and how I want it and be able to listen to it. And then 110 seconds to close me. That's what you want. What's yours? Some of you say, well, it's not enough time. Folks, if Moses can do it in two PowerPoint slides with five bullet points each, you can do it in a lot less. Oh, come on, that was funny too. And then passion. You can't just have passion alone. The people at Kodak had passion. They were passionate about film. Even today, if I go up to people, I had a guy, I was on national, in national news talking about it, and he called me up afterwards and said, Jeff, I think film's coming back. I said, what are you freaking smoking, man? <laughs> See, I, love, I have a passion. I had a passion for pheasants. I love pheasants. Back in my home state of South Dakota, I love to see the pheasants. They're pretty. They're beautiful. I love to watch them run around. I like to get a gun, hunt them down, and kill them. That's how much I love pheasants. I, love pheasants. I was so passionate about pheasants a number of years ago, I started a pheasant farming operation. That's true. Pheasant farming operation, I, I had... 3,000 acres of pheasant farms, and I, and I would have a, a pen the size of this room, and I would put telephone poles around the, the, around the field, and I would put nets up over the field so that the, the pheasants could run free before I killed them, all right? One night in South Dakota, we have thunderstorms that roll through every day, much like this one, a torrential rain. Like where two or three inches came down in, in less than half an hour. And one night I had 10,000 pheasants look up into the skies. It started to have one of those big, huge thunderstorms. 10,000 pheasants huddled together and they opened their little beaks and they drown. These are the stupidest fucking birds on the face of the earth. They call birds foul and pheasants are the reason why. You have to have more than just passion, my friends. You have to talk about it. Talk about your brand. Let's talk about your brand. Brand. Here's the definition of a brand because I don't like the way marketers are talking about brand these days. They talk about my brand, this brand, my brand. It's not your brand. It never has been your brand. You might be the steward of it, but it's not your brand. The customer owns your brand. Brand. Here's how the word brand came from. Brand came from, the, from, from ranchers, from cowboys. That's where the word brand came from. See, brand is something you, you occasionally put on a horse and always put on a cow. It was a visual representation of ownership on the side of a bovine. You would look at it and say, well, that belongs to Jeff. That one belongs to Jim. That one belongs to Pablo. That's what you would look at. You would look at the brand. And now a brand, it's this. A brand is a promise delivered to your customers. So what's your promise? What are you delivering? That passion that you need to put into your brand, what is the promise of which you're delivering to your customers? 
and stand for something. Make sure that you make sure it stands for something. It stands out and happens as is part of what you are. At Kodak, we had this big printer. Oh, by the way, I want to say this. I don't want to forget this. I tell people now that digital companies, they digital companies that they, they're launching now, or, or they used to be traditional companies, and now they want to go digital. Here's a rule for you. If you suck offline, you will suck online. Okay? Just wanted to get that out. Now, when we launched this big printer at Kodak, this was it, they called the Prosper Press. The team came to me and said, well, we're going to launch this at Drupa at the big print show in, in two months, Jeff, and we want to show it to you because you're going to host the press conference and you're going to want to talk about it and we want to show what it looked like and, I, and they showed me a picture of it. And it was a big huge printer, 4,000 pages per minute, the largest inkjet printer in the world, the fastest inkjet printer in the world, the highest quality inkjet printer in the world. It was offset class inkjet on clay-coated stocks, glossy stocks. No one in the world had ever done this. At 4,000 pages per minute, every single page was individual, customized, could be different from one page to the other, one paragraph to the other, one word from the other. It was, and, and it was fast, fast, basically Trees went in one side, sheets of paper shot out the other side. That's what it was. Huge. The size of a, a, a tractor, trailer, truck. And they showed it to me. And it basically was this big, huge, from the size of that stage to the end of that stage, that tall, gray box. I said, you're not launching that. And they said, well, we are. I said, no, you're not launching that. And, I, and they said, well, why? I said, it looks like something that Soviet shot putters have designed. I said, it's ugly. It's a big gray box. You just told me this is the world's fastest printer. The world's fastest printer. The highest quality offset class. And you show me a big gray box. I said, look, when, it, when we pull the covers off of it on stage, and I'm standing before six or 8,000 people, people should look at it and go, oh. They should, like, run up to it when they have their picture taken. It should look like a Maserati. It should look like a Ferrari. It should look like fire is coming out of its ass as it's sitting there on the showroom floor. So I said, redesign it or you're not launching it. So they did. They came back two weeks, and this is what they brought. They rounded the corners. They put some glass windows in it so you could see it. And if you look really, really close, they put a yellow racing stripe down the middle. It looked like something Czechoslovakians designed. Yeah. But it was better. It was better. We have to stand for something. And then cause tension. Again, I want to use this as an example. I put this in here just for you guys. When I got to Kodak, they had changed the logo like two years before I got there. But yet they hadn't redone any of the printed material or anything. You know why? Because they said they were reusing up the old stuff. Are you kidding me? You're an imaging company. You're telling me you're not like replacing the stuff? Start replacing the stuff. I said, first we're going to start with the business cards. Redo the business cards. And they had these iconic business cards. Remember that? With their pictures on it? I said, let's do something different. Let's mix it up. Because you've got to cause tension. I said, how about we show them we're like a new company, something different. So I said, make it a little artsy. So they cut my head off and they put it a little smaller. And I said, why don't we add like their, your Facebook or your, or your Twitter page or whatever. And you add those on your card. And, and then I said on the back, can you, oh, it is back there, sorry. And then I said on the back of the card, why don't you let the people put whatever picture they want on the back of the card? Like a personal branding statement. I mean, isn't that cool? That's me with my horse, Jay, and my ranch. Yeah, yes, I call him Glue as well. Glue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's fucking funny to me. I, I don't know. So, sorry. Right. Anyway, my, I named my horses A, B, C, D. That's Jay. That's Jay. Well, anyway, so I, I said, let's put in a personal branding statement. Why don't we put a picture up there? And, and so I put a memo out and said, that's what we're going to do. So if you like your cats more than your kids, put your cats up there. If you like your car, put your car. I don't care. Whatever you like. It's yours. It's your space. Just put something up there. And so I sent a memo out. Next day, guess who comes to see me? HR and legal. They come in. They sit down and say, Jeff, we have to ask you to rescind your memo. You, we have to stop this process. I said, why? And they said, well, Jeff, come on. 
What happens if someone puts something inappropriate on the back of the car? Well, of course, I said, I hope they do. It would liven this place up around here, right? <laughs> and then I turned to him and said, besides, how are we supposed to find the stupid people in the company? They didn't have an answer for that, so the card stayed. So, Let's talk about this for a second. No matter what happens, the biggest thing, people talk about culture. I will wrap things up, and then I want to bring some friends on stage. And then if you've got questions, I'll be glad to answer those too. People talk about culture, about that's what you have to work on in the company. I say don't, don't bother with culture. Culture takes a long time to develop. Your culture develops over periods of time, just like it does in your family, just like it does in Mexico, just like it does all over the world. Cultures take a long time. And collectively, we make the culture. The biggest thing that you can change in your company is the mood. See, for us at Kodak, the mood was terrible. See, people would come to me and they'd say, Jeff, I like the way it used to be. Make it like it used to be. And I would turn to him and said, well, I like the way I used to look like when I was 20, but I don't look like that anymore. I look better. <laughs> In fact, folks, by the way, this is a jacket that's made for me. I call this the uh, business mullet of suits. Oh, yes, business mullet of suits. It's business on the outside and party on the inside. <laughs> okay. That's right. Well, okay. And so you have to have that attitude. See, I believe that I'm eye candy, you know? I believe I'm super chunky size, but I'm eye candy, right? That's what you have to believe in terms of change the mood. How many times have you been to a restaurant? It's great food, but terrible service. You don't want to go back. But yet, how many times have you been to a kind of a crappy restaurant, but the people are wonderful? You want to go back. You can have a crappy product in a good mood and survive, but I'll guarantee you, you can have the best product in the world and the, and the worst move and you will die. Change the mood. Focus on the mood. Remember the rule of thirds. As you're changing, as you're change agents, one third of them will come with you right away. One third of them will eventually follow and one third will not. Move past the third. Kill off the third. We love them, but we're going to miss them. That should be our motto in terms of how we do it and the way in which we do it. Try different things that are new. In my book, I try to move things that are different. I'm, I put some things. How about this QR codes? Everybody doing QR codes? Love that. Kind of. Unfortunately, QR codes look like someone's digitally vomited on a sheet of paper. <laughs> my book, I change things around a lot differently. I put a snap tag in it. I have 35 chapters. Why? Because I can the average business book is 10 chapters, 5,000 words. I said to the publisher, why? I said, that's the way we do it. I said, well, they, well, they got to be 50,000 words. I said, how about 35 chapters and 1,500 words? And they said, why? I said, because I want to. It adds up to 50,000, add it. That's what we did because see, the average business book is only two weeks for activation, and I wanted more. So I made 35 chapters. I made every heading of every chapter is 140 characters or less. I made every chapter 1,500 words. The first 500 words of every chapter was a blog. Now I got 35 days of tweeting, 35 days of blogs, and more importantly, I put a, a QR code, a snap tag, what I call a branded tag at the front of the book. You take a picture, you tweet it to me, you text it to me, and it comes back with a video of me telling you, telling you what we're going to talk about in the chapter. Now I've captured your name. Average business book sells 7,000 copies. Since January the 3rd, we've sold 280,000 copies. Change it. Make it different. Try things that are new. A number of years ago when I was in college, I got to bring speakers onto the campus, some of the greatest speakers in the world. Margaret Thatcher, Cal Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan, and I even got to bring Jacques Cousteau. Remember Jacques Cousteau, a hero of mine? I watched him when I was little, watching television. I used to have one of those red hats just like him. I'd put it on. I'd sit in front of the TV. I'd watch him. And I got to take the speakers out to dinner the night before, and I was out with Jacques Cousteau. We're out to dinner, and we had a few bottles of wine. 
And he started telling me all these stories. He told me about how he was deep underwater at 100 feet, which is very deep for a diver. When you come up at 100 feet, you have to come up in stages because of the bends. You might catch the bends. And at 100 feet, he was down below. He's in some underwater cave, and he cut his air hose. And that pre at that depth, the pressure, the air shoots out. So he was running out of air, gasping. But he knew he had to make it to the top, so he decided to swim as fast as he can. He even knew he knew in those, in those milliseconds of making that decision that he might get the bends he was going to try for. It. As he started making his way up as fast as he could, out of nowhere, someone grabbed him and stopped him. And it happened to be one of his swimming buddies. And his swimming buddy stopped him, slowed him down, took out his air hose from his mouth and gave it to Jacques Cousteau and shared it with him and back and forth, back and forth. They made it to the top and, of course, he lived because we were out to dinner. I said to him, Mr. Cousteau, weren't you scared? Weren't you petrified? You were facing death. And he turned to me and he said, Jeffrey, one should never be scared when you're in good company. Look around you. This IAB, this group is great company. To be a part of an organization like this where you can share, steal ideas. <laughs> it's okay. It's a wonderful time. And I get the privilege of being in good company with a lot of people. And this next person I want to bring out is Bianca, who is one of the founders of Twixt. And I want to talk about the life of two, I think a cool company. So let's bring Bianca out here, put her in the orb of death, the orb of knowledge. I said we should set this on fire when people come out <laughs> backstage. And I tried to get one of the stagehands backstage to be the first one, and he wouldn't do it. So can we bring, is, is Bianca, where's Bianca? There she comes. Yeah, she's coming. The, give us some music, some clapping here. Let's go. Fabulous, fabulous. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Well, this is my favorite part when you get to do this <laughs> and everything. I met Bianca a few years ago when you invited me to speak and be a part of this, but you've left the organization. And you're sponsoring my talk today, which I think is great. You and, and, and Henya Group with Pablo. Exactly. Uh, I know Pablo's trying to make it here, but, um, but you guys are sponsoring, which I want to thank you. But you've got something that's really cool, and that's the sharing. And, and, and ev everyone talks about all of these, these huge networks of social media, but you've come up with something that's different, and I think really cool, and we're going to share. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, of course. But um, before, I want to say that this is an honor to be on this stage again. It feels like being at home. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Come on, this is cool. Okay. So right now I'm, I'm not talking at the beginning of the day, but at the end of the day. And this is a, a very, very special, especially to be here with you, Jeffrey. So as you're saying, like we're introducing something new, me and my team actually, I brought them with me if you can yep. we bring them out? Yes, of course. Make sure Tyson we got Roman. We got Roman and, and, and Tyson. And Tyson, here they come. Come on out. Look at that. Woo. Great. Come on, give them a round. Hello, applause. Mexico. Come on. Come on. Yeah, Drive he, it up. See, I don't know if you know, he's German and he's pretty pissed about the comment earlier. <laughs> yes. I got so, you. <laughs> they go, my next keynote, and I'm going to talk about America. And, and, Tyson, <laughs> and Tyson's Canadian, so we all, we'll all get along with him. So that's good. So I'm very so, polite. He's very polite, exactly. <laughs> so talk to us about the product. Tell me about the product. Because I, when, I, when you told me about this the first time, I said, I'm in. I want in. I want to be a part of it. Tell me how to do this. And now I, I get to see it. So sh let's, let's show the people. Well, we're introducing Twix. The company is called Life of Two. We're introducing Twix, which is a, a new social network and a new social network focused on two people. So forget about all your 500, 800 friends. This is about you and your most important relationship. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your wife, your husband, your significant other, your couple. And it's an exclusive channel, uh, communication and co a coordination channel just for these two. And we just think that this relationship is so important and communication is so special between a couple that this really deserves their own platform. And that's why we are creating Twixt and um, we are pre-launching it 
right today. here, right here in Mexico. So we, we got it through the, uh, the, the iTunes Mexico. You can download it. We can download it right now. So you can take, take your phones out right now. Come on. <laughs> Let's have, take your phones out for those who like to give it a shot, and we'll show you how to do this. This is real simple to do, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right. You just go to iTunes Mexico, and this is like a really big thing because we are not, we haven't launched yet. We're launching next month, and um, so now this is just a beta. This is a pre-beta. Wow. This is a pre-beta only for the people here in IAB Connector. Four days download party, so you can download from he yeah from now until Sunday, and then we're gonna launch big time next month in the U.S. and all over the world. So right now it's only Mexico. So with my my wife or anyone else I'd choose to do this with, right? <laughs> better your wife. Yeah, no, better no, no, my better wife. Your yeah. wife. <laughs> better my wife. I, well, I got two phones. Anyway. Now, and uh, I'm no. just joking. <laughs> She's five foot one, but she'll kick my ass. So, um, and I'm sure someone just tweeted that to her right now. So, um, so let's say I wanted to communicate with her, and I want to talk about my mood with her, or I want to share a calendar, or I want to share photos. Only she and I can see it. My secretary can't see it. My kids can't see it. So I can do some cool things. I even like the freeze out, which is going to happen a lot with me, where my, my wife will get mad at me, and she freezes out my phone, and it crackles, right? <laughs> exactly. So that, which is cool. Yep. Oh, come on. So that's funny, wanna... <laughs> too. Fun. So what about if we update your mood on stage now? Let's do that. Let's do that. Can okay. we show it? So practically you can share moods. Can we, so show, I don't know. It? Can, can can you we show it on the camera? Can we do that? Can you zoom in? All right. Can so you we'll zoom in? in? We'll zoom in. Let's do it like well, let's, this. Let's, let's do it, do like it here. Okay. Right. So if I want here to. Here we have the screen and then we go pick the mood. The mood, which and is then smiley you can, face. Yeah. You, so you can choose between 12 moods here. So I can so say like, ooh, in love. That sucks. So let's don't do that one. Uh, how about, oh, let's, let's do that. That's uh, cute. Oh, Mary, you just got married, so it's really overrated. <laughs> um, we can do, uh, I'm just joking. How about, how about coffee time? Because we're, we're going to leave here, and we're going to have cocktails, and you guys are doing a coffee time. So let's do a coffee time, because I can go right to the coffee time. And there it is, posted right there. Look at that, coffee time, because that's what's going to happen right now. We're yeah. going to go here, and we're going to go into the next room. They can come and see you, and they can get a couple of coffee mugs. Is that yep. right? The pe people that put their mood in coffee mode, they get a Nescafe mug for them and their and their significant other, and we yeah, and, and lots of other surprises. And and Jeffrey, one of the few and people. Exactly. I also have something. Actually, I bought this. It's my personal book. I bought it myself because I think. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think in, uh, if something has to do an impact in your life, you have to buy it yourself. Right? That's what I believe in. You know, you have to Are really we selling my books? No. No. I have. No, All sorry. Right. <laughs> but I bought it and I would love to you to sign it. And I will. would love you to come to the, our booth. We're going to do that. And, and then we have some of these to give away. So the first people that are in the booth get a, get a couple copies, right? Yeah. I okay. have mine. I'm going to keep mine. But cool. Yeah. All right. And we see everybody at the Twix booth, but I have some questions for you, actually. Oh. Okay. Well, well I have questions. one question and the audience, Thanks. I'm sure, has some questions. Does anybody got a question, or you want me to sit at the booth? Well, I have the first question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, okay. Ready. I'm ready to Jeffrey, drink. Jeffrey, what kind of digital advice would you give to the Mexican marketers, to the marketers here in the room right now? Do it. Just as fast as you possibly can, no matter what it is you want to do, do it with great speed. And you're going to make mistakes. It's okay. It's the Internet. You can fix it. All right? <laughs> And you can fix it fast. Even with mobile, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make huge mistakes. No one's going to die. You're in marketing. The worst thing that's going to happen is maybe a paper cut. Okay? So that's what I tell you is to take the risk and make things happen and make the change. That's the biggest thing you could possibly do right now. Okay. Oh. So now it's your turn. What are your questions? I, I see somebody getting up here. No, she's going. No? She's got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I don't blame her. So I tell you what, we're going to be okay. in the Twix booth right after this. So come and see us in the ah. Twix booth, and we'll answer your questions. We'll have some fun, and we'll enjoy ourselves. Thanks so much for having okay. us. Thank, Thank you, you, Mexico. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>